Welcome to the People of Animal Health podcast. The host of our podcast is Stacy Purcell. Stacy is the leading executive recruiter for the animal health and veterinary industries. She's the founder of Therio Partners and the Vet Recruiter. Stacy has placed more professionals in key positions within the animal health and veterinary industries than any executive search professional. And along the way, Stacy has built relationships with some outstanding people who are doing incredible things to make a difference. The People of Animal Health podcast features industry leaders and trailblazers who have made a significant impact or are making an impact in the animal health and veterinary industries. Stacy chats with them to learn more about their lives, their careers, and the unique and interesting things that they have done to contribute to the animal health or veterinary industries. She is here to share their stories with you. Now here's the host of our podcast, Stacy Purcell. Hello, and welcome to the People of Animal Health podcast. On today's show, we are talking with Joe Landolina, an entrepreneur who was constantly experimenting with different natural materials in the lab as a young adult. Joe conceived an adhesive hemostatic gel composed of plant-based polymers that could adhere to a wound site and simultaneously support the natural clotting process. To refine and manufacture the gel technology he invented, Joe with his partner Isaac Miller founded Cressalon, formerly Sunaris, which has since grown into a medical device company headquartered in Brooklyn, New York. As Chief Executive Officer, Joe is now gearing up to take the company's proprietary product, Vetagel, to the veterinary market, offering a faster, more reliable solution in hemostatus for veterinarians performing both routine treatments and complex operations in clinics every day. As a face of Cressalon, Joe meets with investors, clinicians, and industry key opinion leaders alike to keep a pulse on the market, meanwhile leading all strategic initiatives internally. Joe's research background is in biocompatible polymers. In 2013, he was selected as a Barry M. Goldwater Scholar in recognition of his outstanding potential in scientific research. In 2014, Joe was named a TED Global Fellow and has since traveled around the world representing Cressalon. Joe is also a former innovation consultant at his alma mater, NYU College of Engineering, and on the board of eLab NYC, which supports the development of NYC as the new world leader in life sciences entrepreneurship. Welcome on to the People of Animal Health podcast. And how are you, Joe? Well, thank you so much for having me, Stacey. It's, it, it's great to be here. Well, Joe, I know that you have already experienced tremendous success at this point in your still early career, but I would love to start off at the bottom and the very beginning of your career. What was your life like growing up and where did you grow up? Sure. Uh, so I, I got a very early start and, and had a little bit of an unusual child. But my, my grandfather was an executive at a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey, Hoffman LaRoche. And when he retired from pharma, he decided to follow a second passion in life, which meant that uh, he started a vineyard. And a, a, as a result, I, I grew up right next door to the winery uh, with, the chemist- with the chemistry lab across the street from my house and a grandfather who learned lab safety in the early 60s. Uh, so that meant that Effectively, from the time that I could walk, I would get home, walk directly from the school bus into the lab and work alongside my grandfather. And as, as I got older and older, I, my, my area of interest uh, really started to, uh, started to shift uh, to uh, how we can take uh, chemistry and use that to, uh, to, to apply into my, my other interests, which was medicine. And uh, as a young kid, if you'd asked me uh, what I wanted to do, I, I would have told you I wanted to become a surgeon. And so I was always really interested by the medical field, uh, but uh, learning chemistry uh, be- became part of uh, became part of my early childhood. When did you first figure out what you wanted to do professionally? So I, I was again, I was lucky. I, I was really, uh, and from a very young age, I, I knew that on, on one hand, I, I knew I always wanted to start a company, and I knew that I always wanted it to be somewhere within the medical field, uh, and particularly in the application of chemistry into medicine. Uh, I did not know that it would be so early on in my career. Uh, I, I didn't realize that I would be starting Cressalon at the age of 17 as, as a freshman in, in undergrad. Uh, but and 
when, when I started school, my, uh, my goal, like I said, was really just to go to medical school. And I, I was trying to do everything I could to, uh, to build up my resume and to set myself apart uh, from, from other students. And, uh, and, and that was really how, uh, how I fell into uh, Crestalon. Well, tell us that story, Joe. Tell us the story of the very beginning of your career. How did you get started? Sure. So my, uh, my parents uh, very astutely realized that if, if I kept going into a lab and blindly mixing things together, uh, like my grandfather was, uh, was letting me do, uh, that uh, I, I would probably have an accident at, at some point. Uh, so they, they very, uh, uh, very smartly encouraged me as a high school student to go and, and quote unquote, uh, learn research the right way. Uh, so I, I did two summers uh, doing tissue engineering research at Columbia University uh, in, in New York. I mean, that was really my, my first foray into engineering or into tissue engineering. And I, I fell head over heels in love with it. And one of the projects that we were working on in that lab was taking plant-based scaffolding. And so these are an acellular uh, plant-based scaffolds, so basically a, a scaffold for cells to grow on that don't include cells itself. And, and you could take this scaffold inject stem cells into it uh, and have those stem cells turn into human tissue. Uh, in, in our case, it was cartilage. And that lab was taking these uh, scaffolds and using it to regrow cartilage to put back into the knees of athletes. And I, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, so being a young, arrogant kid who had never seen failure before, uh, I decided I was gonna go back to my winery lab and grow cartilage. Uh, and obviously this was, over a decade ago, you couldn't just uh, ring up a chemical distributor and say, "Hi, I'm, I'm a winery. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to have some cell culture uh, chemicals uh, or, or reagents." Uh, so, if, if there was anything I needed, I had to make it myself, or build it myself, find it myself. So, I became pretty good at plant-based chemistries. And uh, what we did is, I, I, I was taking algae and I was trying to extract polymers out of algae to grow my cartilage. And, and, and that experiment failed miserably. But what I found was this blend of two polymers that came out of the algae that would instantly reassemble when it came into contact with skin uh, or, or with the wound. And it would stick and it wouldn't let go until you wanted it to. And I, I had this idea, which was to take that material uh, and inject it into an actively bleeding bullet wound to at the very least stabilize the patient so you can move them from point A to point B without them bleeding out. Uh, and at this time, I, I was then an incoming freshman into NYU. Like I said, I was 17 years old. And uh, I entered their business plan competition. I, I, frankly speaking, I, I didn't think we would win. Uh, I just knew that if we got to the quarterfinals, there were free MBA classes. And as an engineer's engineer, I, I, I wanted to be well-rounded. I wanted something I could put on my resume, and I thought it would be a great experience. Uh, so I, I met Isaac uh, Isaac Miller, who's uh, our, our CFO and my co-founder, who at the time was a business student at the Stern School of Business at NYU. And we entered the competition and, and we won. Uh, and it, it gave us just enough capital to start growing uh, and, and, and start building. Uh, and, and that was, uh, like I mentioned, about 11 years ago. Uh, so over the last 11 years, we've, we've taken what was a, a dorm room idea uh, and turned it into now the, the only biomanufacturer in the five boroughs in New York with 55 engineers and commercial operations. Uh, for better gel across the globe and, uh, and what will soon be uh, hopefully uh, human operations as well uh, with the FDA application that we just submitted for human use. So how did you go from there, from that uh, competition that you entered to becoming an entrepreneur? Tell us about that journey at the beginning, sure. if you will. And I, I, so this is a question I get a lot and it's something that I, I, I wish that there was a moment in time uh, where I realized that it turned from a dorm room idea or a dorm room concept into a full company. Uh, but, but in reality, it, it was more of a slow burn in, in, those, in those early years uh, where uh, after that competition, we really, I, I, I mean, I didn't think that this was something that a bunch of kids effectively could pull off. And, uh, and I, I was, uh, and we knew that we had a potential for having a great product. Uh, we knew that the that the market was there uh, if we were to bring it to market, uh, but it took us a very long time to go through the research and to figure out exactly what it was that we had and, and realize that, that yes, we, we did actually have uh, the technology that we said we did. Uh, so I mean, over those first four years, I, I was still in school. And so I completed my, my undergrad and my graduate work. And then in 2014, uh, post-graduation, 
uh, we, we dove into it full time. And, and at that point, we had a fully working prototype uh, or a fully working product uh, where we, we knew it could do what we said it could do. Uh, and a lot of that was just in the heads down time that we took uh, trying to figure out who we were and, and what we were as, as a business uh, while we were all still in school. And how did you get into the animal health industry? So admittedly, we, when, when I came up with this idea, and then, I mean, again, as a 17 year old, I, I didn't realize how robust this industry was by, by any means. So we uh, were initially focused almost entirely on uh, traumatic use, so, so military use. And, and then 2012 came around. And, and in 2012 here in New York, Hurricane Sandy hit the city and Hurricane Sandy was incredibly destructive. We, we had, uh, especially down in South Brooklyn, uh, the Coney Island Aquarium, uh, th th there were severe uh, damages that were done. And I, I heard stories around that time of vets being unable to stop bleeding uh, and, and, losing, uh, and losing patients uh, because th there was nothing on hand to stop uh, major traumatic hemorrhage. Uh, and, and the team at the time, we, we realized that, uh, that this was a, a massive market that we had overlooked. Uh, so in 2012, uh, we signed up for the AVMA uh, convention. Uh, and I, I remember there was a photo of us somewhere uh, in, in, in these terrible blue polos that we had embroidered in Chinatown for something like $5 a shirt or something like that. And we, uh, uh, and we, we saved up to go out to that conference. And, and, and at, over the course of that conference, we spoke to about 300 vets, all of whom said that this was a massive need. And if we could bring this product to market, uh, it would be something that they would definitely use. And, uh, and with that, we, we found... Uh, a great market uh, that was willing to give us feedback at every turn uh, and a market that we could really make a difference in. Uh, so Cresselon from that day forward became an animal health company. And when did you first feel like you were truly beginning to gain uh, traction with Cresselon? So, so like I mentioned earlier, it, it, it really was a slow burn in those early years. I mean, we definitely had wins and especially as we got into 2014 or 2015, we had significant media coverage and we had an over 140 million views on videos through outlets like Bloomberg or TED. Uh, and and uh, we became, or we, we entered a, a level of notoriety where uh, instead of us going to conferences and no one hearing about us, uh, we, we'd end up going to conferences and people had read about us on the news. But, uh, uh, but really, I, I think that and more recently, uh, with the commissioning of our factory, uh, with the building of our team, uh, with the commercialization, uh, it, it's, it's one thing to be a startup with a great idea. It's another thing to actually see that product save lives in the field. And, uh, and, and, and that's where we are now. And that, that's something that uh, it, it makes it much more palpable um, that, than it was in the beginning and something that, that, that I'm very excited about. I know that some successful entrepreneurs have massive success and also some low points. Walk us through the highest high and the lowest low up to this point in your career or with Cresslon, if you will. Sure. I mean, so I think that the highest high, again, like I just said, is really that first time the product uh, was used in a patient. And, uh, and that's something where I mean, especially in life sciences, you spend all of this time proving the safety and the efficacy uh, of, of your device or of your technology, uh, all this time making sure uh, and building up to the moment of being able to save your first life. Uh, and really the, uh, the, the best moment for me was being able to see that mission start to come true. And uh, I, I think that brings true for the entire team here. It's, uh, it's one thing to be engineers working on a solution. It's another thing to actually see it happen before your own eyes. Uh, and, and, and that was, and when we first launched BetterGel, it was really great to see. And, and, and in fact, it's a feeling that doesn't go away uh, where every single day that we get a testimonial uh, or, or a review of the product in uh, where uh, we learn that we've saved a patient. Uh, it, it, uh, it's the same exact feeling uh, where, where you can see that mission coming full circle uh, and, and it makes it worth it for, for all the years uh, that we've put in the development here. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, you're absolutely right, which is, uh, you know, the, the journey of entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. It, it's ups and downs. And then for, uh, for all of the high highs, you, you get lots of low lows. So I, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face was around 2015, 2016, where we were coming off of all of our media attention. Uh, we had severe and significant demand from the market. Uh, and then we realized uh, that 
the team was still very young uh, and we were still relatively underfunded, but our, our demand uh, was significant. It, it was uh, uh, far more than what we could make uh, in, in our facility. And we realized very quickly that uh, most biotechs or most companies like ours outsource the production of their product uh, to someone who has been doing this for, for years and years. Uh, but our product is so novel that it could not be manufactured by anybody else. Uh, and uh, we were presented with a crossroads, which was either shut down the business uh, or figure out a way to do it ourselves. And, uh, and I, I'm a New Yorker born and raised, and I, I tend to subscribe to a very DIY type of mentality. And uh, if anyone here has seen our offices, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, if something looks horrible around the office, it's probably because I, I did the sheetrocking and the spackling myself. Uh, and that carries through in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, but we, we decided in 2015 that we weren't going to shut the business down, that, that, that the stakes were too high and that, uh, and that the reward was too great of being able to get a product like this out to customers. Uh, and, uh, and so we decided to build our own manufacturing. Uh, and, and that started with us having to go back to our own investors and ask them for 10 times the amount of money that they had put in. Uh, and surprisingly, they said yes. Uh, and, uh, and led us through a, a multi-year process of taking a market that was excited for the product uh, and, and effectively making them wait um, while we could uh, build up a world-class manufacturing site that, that could support the demands of the market uh, so that uh, we could do so uh, and provide product as, as safely uh, and, and, and at the highest level uh, as possible. And it, it was difficult, uh, and especially here in New York, uh, building that type of manufacturing was something that really hadn't been done uh, in, in, in modern day uh, before. And it, I mean, we're, we're now on the other end of that and something that I'm very proud of, but it, it, was, um, it, it, it was definitely a challenge to go through uh, because we were, we were trailblazers through that in a lot of ways. What have you learned most from your journey up to this point so far? I mean, I, I think it, it's one of those things where, I mean, you, you learn bits and pieces about yourself that, that you didn't know were there. Um, and uh, one of the most important things here is really just and the, the value in that and perseverance uh, and, and being able to stick it through. And I, I think that some of the value in starting a company as young as we did is that you're uh, you're almost blessed by this uh, by this naivety, uh, where you uh, don't know what you don't know, and as a result, uh, and you optimistically charge headfirst uh, into your challenges, and, and that allows you to take things challenge by challenge instead of. Uh, I think if you had pulled me aside at seventeen and shown me a decade long path to commercialization, uh, I, I may have gotten discouraged uh, and. Uh, and being able to get through it and see that you can do it and realize uh, that, that it is possible uh, when uh, you know, the vast majority of people we spoke to in the very beginning said that, uh, that even the manufacturing of this product would be impossible uh, to, it, it feels good uh, to, have, uh, to have been able to do it and be able to get, get to the other side because it, it, it makes other problems pale in comparison. Well, like what you said about you don't know what you don't know, and you charged headfirst into the challenges. And one of the things that I've learned consistently across um, with talking to different entrepreneurs is they they did not listen to the naysayers, um, and that's what you know you did not. You just charged headfirst into the challenges. You didn't listen to the um, the naysayers. Um, I'm curious, Joe, what's been the most surprising thing to you so far during your career in the animal health industry? Sure. So it really two two major things, and uh, I right, said so the first thing is just the diversity of uh, of medicine and techniques that exist in in animal health. It's something where uh, I mean, growing up from from uh, looking from the outside in, uh, and you you don't realize how many types of procedures and how sophisticated uh, the the techniques are uh, in in the space, and it's something that uh, I mean, has been. And especially with a surgical product like uh, like Vetagel, uh, it, it allows you to really sit on the forefront of what's being done in animal health and, and to see the work that's being done there and, and the techniques that can be used to save patient lives. It, it, it is just, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and then the second thing, uh, compared to the human markets, I, I love how tight knit and how close and friendly uh, the animal health market is uh, in a, uh, uh, and just just overall, uh, where I mean, we 
as a young budding company, were have been benefited time and time again uh, by uh, by veterinarians, by surgeons, uh, by, by by vet nurses and technicians um, who are more than willing uh, to tell us what they love and what they hate about our product, about products that they're currently using uh, to help us make a product that can uh, that can impact patient lives better. Uh, and that that's something uh, that uh, I, I've really enjoyed being part of. And what does your crystal ball say about the future of the animal health industry, Joe? And so one of the things that I'm most excited to see in animal health uh, is uh, the emergence of a much more robust robust vet device market. Uh, And it's something where I I, I think that animal health today lags slightly behind the human space in the availability of devices that are manufactured for the vet surgeon, uh, where they're are very few vet device companies uh, that, that, that exist today uh, that are not um, uh, requiring a surgeon to purchase human devices and, and, and use them on their own. And I, I'm really excited to see um, more types of technology that are designed vet first, as opposed to being designed for human use and, and then co-opted into animal health, which as you and I both know, it's uh, it never quite works out perfectly uh, when you try to take something that was designed for a human uh, and, and and fit it into uh, and fit it into animal health. And Joe, today I would love for you to share with our listeners about the kinds of specific projects that you're up to right now at Crestlawn. Sure. I mean, so we, we have a lot of exciting things going on here, uh, and we. Uh, so on, on the Vetagel front, uh, we have uh, continued our, our global launch of the, uh, of, of the product. And so we're looking forward in the first quarter, uh, we'll be doing a launch in the United Kingdom uh, with Vetagel, uh, which, will slow, which will eventually turn into a launch in, in all of Europe. Um, and that's something that, again, uh, based, on the, based on the great feedback we've been getting here in the US, uh, that's something that I'm really excited to see and get to the other side of the pond. Uh, and then on top of that with Cresselon, uh, we, we just filed our first 510K for human use. Uh, and, uh, and so that means that uh, hopefully and, and, and very likely in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll actually see our first human life saved uh, with this technology. And that, that's something that I'm uh, very proud of because it, it just, it allows us to execute that mission uh, in the same way, uh, but, but, but on a much broader scale. Joe, I know that you are so busy. What does a typical day look like for you these days at Crestlawn? Sure. I mean, so I am, uh, I'm an engineer's engineer. And what I mean by that is that I, I get bored if I do the same thing every single day. And I, I love solving problems, uh, but uh, I'd rather not say it, solve the same problem over and over again, uh, ideally. Uh, so I, I, so my, my typical day uh, looks like this. So I uh, try to walk 10 miles every single day. Um, and that, that's, uh, that, that's what my way of, uh, of clearing my mind. Um, and so I, I walk into, uh, I walk into the office and, uh, and it's split between meeting with customers. Uh, I, I try to, uh, I try to attend at least, uh, one conference a month, uh, just to, uh, cause I, I feel like if I, it, if I don't talk to customers about the product, I start to feel disconnected. Uh, so I, I like to, uh, I like to be someone on the front lines, uh, we, I have a, a very large uh, group of investors that, that, that I'm very lucky to have. So I, I spend a good amount of my time um, dealing uh, and dealing with uh, our investors and, and working with them to make sure that, uh, that, that we're going where we need to go. Uh, and, and then growing the team uh, is the rest of that. And so we are a very fast growing team. Uh, we, we have 55 employees, uh, but we have 40 open positions today. Uh, we, we are, uh, in order to scale, especially uh, over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, there's a lot of growth uh, that Crestland's going to need to see. Uh, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of ensuring that the teams that we're working with uh, have the resources that they need and have the correct people to be able to do what we need them to do as, as the business keeps growing. What are a few of your daily habits that you believe have allowed you to achieve success during your career? So I, and so I. I mentioned my walks, uh, but I, I really, I, I like the, I, I like consistency uh, where I found that there, there's a lot of chaos that happens with entrepreneurship uh, where 
uh, like I said, there's a roller coaster, uh, meaning that that roller coaster could be up one day and down the other, it could be up one year and down the other. Uh, and, but having a consistent routine uh, that you can fall back on, I, I feel like uh, keeps you grounded uh, and keeps you and having time for family and for friends and for things that, that, that are not work. Because it, at the end of the day, the, my uh, this this job is not a nine to five job. Uh, this, this runs 24 uh, seven. And if you don't have uh, and or try to keep some sense of consistency, uh, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, so I, I try to uh, keep some semblance of a routine, uh, no matter how much travel, no matter how much uh, other things are going on. And, and, and that, that, that helps you move forward. I like that, uh, the, the consistency there. Uh, Joe, what mentor has made the biggest impact on your career? I would have to say it's my grandfather. Uh, so he uh, he was the one who started the vineyard, and uh, he was a, he was an entrepreneur, uh, started a number of businesses, and uh, and was uh, and really especially in the earliest phases of my career, it sort of uh, was my guiding light in helping me uh, I design how I wanted to build uh, the, the, this business, and, uh, and definitely was was never afraid to tell me. Uh, and if he didn't like something that I was doing, or if he thought I could be just doing something better. Uh, so I, I, I'd have to go with him. What has been the biggest adversity that you've had to fight through during your career? So, so again, I, I think it would have to be that manufacturer. Uh, it's something where uh, it was a problem that no one had solved before in the world. Uh, and anyone we spoke to told us it was likely impossible. And, uh, and we... Uh, like, like I mentioned, we were able to get through it, uh, but it, it, it didn't come easily. What advice would you give the younger version of yourself if you were just starting out on this journey? Right, so I, I, for better or for worse, I, I, I am my younger self. I, uh, I, I, the, and what, what I'll say is that I, I, I always strive uh, to get better, to do better. Uh, but what, what I don't like to do is harp on what I could have done better uh, because I am a collection of all of the mistakes that, uh, that I've made. And, and, and every single mistake we made, uh, we learned how not to do it again. And uh, as, as we move forward, I, I guarantee you, if we, if we talk in 10 more years or, or in 20 years, uh, I'll have made a, a, made a lot more mistakes uh, than this, but I, I'll, I'll be better for it. Well, we find that most successful people tend to have idiosyncrasies that are actually their superpower. What idiosyncrasy do you have? Oh, I, I, I actually think it's my walking. My people think that I'm crazy sometimes for, for doing 10 miles a day. And, and I, I, do it in, uh, I do it in dress shoes, nonetheless. And, uh, and, but I, I need that time to, especially where you're getting asked questions all the time uh, by, by everybody all day, every day. I, I like having my, my 10 miles of walking time um, where I, I can sit and decompress and think through the challenges of the day uh, and, uh, and help approach things from a much more level set uh, mindset. And, uh, and so it, I, I, I tend to get jittery if I, if I don't have my time to, uh, to, to take longer walks. And what do you struggle with the most? What is your weakness or your kryptonite? Podcasts. Podcast? Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell, why is that? Uh, oh, well, it, it, it's just I, uh, uh, sometimes it, it's hard to put all of my, to put all my thoughts down into uh, it, it just succinct answers for these questions, but uh, I'm so appreciative that, uh, that, that you let me on here nonetheless. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. We're glad you're here, Joe. What message or principle do you wish you could teach everyone? So especially the, the entrepreneurs that are listening, I, I, it, I know that there are so many people here that want to start companies, uh, but my, my advice to anyone looking to start a company is, it may actually seem counterintuitive, but, but it, it's don't. It, it's do not start a company unless you are truly passionate uh, about what it is that you're doing. And I, um, I came out of a very entrepreneurial school, uh, and so I saw lots of great startups uh, that were highly successful, and I saw a lot of people trying to start things just for the sake of starting things, uh, because everyone else was. And, and I could not have done this uh, for 11 years without being truly passionate about wanting to get up and, and do this every single day. And I, I, I'm, I consider myself truly lucky uh, that I haven't 
once in my career woken up and thought, you know, what, I'd rather not come into work today. You know, this has been something um, where I, I enjoy what I do and I enjoy the problem that we're solving. And if I didn't do that, I don't know how I'd be able to, tr to tackle uh, that, that roller coaster. Uh, so it, it's something that uh, if you are going to get into entrepreneurship uh, and wait until you have something uh, that, 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 again, you can truly see yourself as passionate about. And, and one of the best pieces of advice that I received, there was a professor who asked me, Joe, I, I want you to close your eyes and imagine yourself uh, at your retirement party. Uh, are you retiring from this? Can you be retiring from this? And if the answer is no, or even maybe, don't do it. And uh, and I, I think in a world where, where there's so much instant gratification, it's hard to it's hard to think about. But it, it's uh, I mean I I, I just you, know, you can't fake true passion for, for what it is that you do, and you need that uh, if, in order to make something succeed. Joe, some of our guests say that they've had a key book that they read that really helped them to change their mindset and their approach to success. Do you have a key book in your life that has impacted you the most? And if so, I'd love to hear about that. Sure. Uh, so it, it might be funny because it, it, it's not as uh, it's not as entrepreneurial a book as, as maybe some others are. Uh, but there, there's a book called Napoleon's Button: Seventeen Molecules to Change History, and uh, and and the, the title sounds kind of funny, uh, but it comes from the story where. Uh, when Napoleon made his troops march into Russia, uh, the buttons on the jackets for his troops were made out of tin. And uh, what they didn't know was that tin in extreme cold would crumble, uh, it turns to powder. Uh, so that means that as winter came, uh, the buttons on the jackets were, that were supposed to be keeping the troops warm fell apart. And, um, and, and they were unable to keep themselves warm. And, and as a result, uh, Napoleon had a failed campaign. And it was Funny, we, we can, and if, if you're a war historian, you can point to a bunch of other issues, but one of the simplest things was just that their buttons didn't work. Uh, and I, and th that, that book, I read that in, uh, I think I was a freshman in high school, and, and it really stuck with me for two reasons. So the first of which uh, is that I really enjoyed how uh, something at the molecular level uh, and, and something uh, that's entirely chemical that we may overthink uh, uh, or, or overlook uh, could have a, such a drastic effect on, on, on the course of, of modern day history. Uh, but the second thing is really just, uh, it, it's a constant reminder uh, to uh, make sure that, that we don't overlook the minutia of things uh, because it, it can be important. And, and it's something that I, I've always taken with me and uh, at the very least it, it's a funny cocktail story to tell. Uh, but uh, it, it stayed in the back of my mind, especially as we're growing the business uh, where and you could have something uh, with true scale, uh, but you need to make sure that you're not only thinking about the big picture, you're also thinking about the small picture uh, as well. Well, Joe, you've got the mic. What is one thing that you want to share with our listeners at the People of Animal Health podcast before you drop the mic today? Uh, and so, so Stacey, what I, what I really want to just uh, say is uh, it, it just give my thanks for you, uh, to you for, uh, for putting this together. I'm so appreciative that, uh, that you've had me on today, and, uh, and this is a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for being here. We enjoyed it.